happen. Okay, so in terms of announcements, I came across something this weekend that I wanted to show you. So this headline caught my eye. The most boring person in the world works in data analysis, likes watching TV, and lives in a town. It's me! It's me! I won! I mean, I knew it was boring, but I didn't think I was the most boring person in the world. And so I thought, are you sure? Like, this is a really high honor. And I kept reading. And do you know what the other most boring hobby is? Sleeping. I love to sleep, too. So congratulations to those of us who are officially boring. I just thought that was awesome. Data analysis is boring, but you know what? It pays the bills. That's, that's what I say. Sleeping is a great hobby. I highly recommend it. The other thing I highly recommend, by the way, transitioning, is after some deliberation, Jonathan has decided to teach something different in the fall than what he had planned on. He is going to bring back a course on Bayesian psychometric modeling that he taught the first semester that we were here in 2019. So it's been a few years. And so those of you who are in IRT right now and those of you who are planning on doing SEM in the fall, this would be an excellent course to try to fit in in terms of the timing because he's going to go back over different psychometric models, including IRT and CFA, and go through how they would be estimated using Bayesian estimation instead of maximum likelihood. And the process of going through and writing all of that code really forces you to understand exactly what's in the model because Bayes, you, you kind of have to spell out everything yourself. So I would recommend that. Um, he is also giving a talk on Friday about multidimensional item response models, misconceptions, and that kind of thing. That is going to be at 2.30 in room 204 and also on Zoom. Um, you may have seen it in an email already, but I'll send it back out to the class too so that you can have that on your calendars. I'm going to be there in person. So one of the first things I've actually done like on campus besides be here with y'all. So kind of nervous about that, but uh, we're going to make it work. And yeah, I think those were all my housekeeping announcements, updated grades. Uh, will it be recorded? I'm not sure. I told him that he should record it, but he was sort of on the fence as whether he wanted to. So um, I'll let you know. Um, heads up, there is another Bayesian class in PSQF. Yes, that is true. It would be very different. The one that I'm talking about is listed as a special topics course. The number is 7375. So those courses are uh, courses that people teach that don't have a dedicated number. So you can take multiple instances of 7375 and have it count across semesters. So don't worry if you already have one in your catalog that's like that. But I'd be happy to answer classes, uh, questions about that, and he would as well. So. Uh, would this be a good one if you haven't taken IRT? Yes. So especially if you're going to do SEM with me in the fall, which I think is the case, yes. So I'm going to do IRT in the context of SEM because the way that I teach SEM is the same way that I teach this class, right? So factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis is, for, is the analog to general linear models. IRT is the analog to generalized linear models. So to me, you have to go both to make it work. And then once you get to SEM, you'll be able to put in um, relationships among the latent traits regardless of how they're measured. So that way you have full flexibility in being able to put together predictive models regardless of what kind of observed outcomes you have. So yes, please take it. And it's on Wednesdays and Fridays so that it will not conflict with any of my courses for two reasons. Number one, because we have overlapping students in the courses, and number two, because we have an overlapping child. So if Huey gets sick or gets kicked out of school again or something like that, somebody has to be available to go get him. No, that had happened. You laugh, but he's been kicked out of preschool three times. We got a phone call that they couldn't get him to calm down, and we had to go get him. So, yes. Proud parent right there. Anywho. Any uh, other questions about classes, assignments, homework, housekeeping? Um, if anyone wants to have a conversation about what classes would be good to take at any point, I'm happy to speak with any of you about that. Um, so just let me know. Okay. Then I will close that. What we were talking about last time was moving over into the field of more continuous outcomes, so binomial outcomes, and then heading into 
a new example today. Uh, what do you remember about binomials? Let's do some review. Anything? Go for it. It is useful to pre predict double bounded uh, outcome. Yeah, so we're talking about outcomes like percent correct, where they're bounded above and below. So the worst you can do is zero, and the best you can do is one. And we can trick that into becoming a binomial outcome by modeling the number of correct trials out of the total. And functionally speaking, the logit link function is going to provide the predicted proportion correct, even though it's modeling numbers of trials. So yeah, we're back to logits. Uh, what do we have to worry about with respect to variability? Anything or something? That's a softball. Do we have to worry about this, yes or no? <laughs> There's very few instances in which the answer is no. So what kind of model um, is binomial with respect to variability? Does it have something extra to it or no? Okay, seeing a lot of uh, non-committed faces. How about we go back over this? Would that sound good? It's been like five days. I mean, it's a long time ago. So sure, let's go back over a few. Hit the highlights. So binomial. Let's start, yeah, we'll start here. This is slide four. Too legit to quit. So we are back to predicting the log of a probability, or a proportion rather, in this case, um, using a binomial model. So the same issues that we have with binary data, we have with respect to making sure that our predicted proportions don't go outside the boundaries. But unlike binary data, we have to worry about extra variability in the model because we have all the possibilities between 0 and 1 in this outcome. So it's not, it's not binary, it's continuous from 0 to 1. So we have a couple different choices as to how we can characterize the conditional distribution. Binomial is the one that is sort of the starter. It's analogous to Poisson. That one has only one parameter. Variance depends on the mean, exactly. That's why I say it's analogous to Poisson. Because it's rarely sufficient, but it's kind of the starting place for these types of outcomes. So the binomial distribution models P, the probability of a 1. So you can think of that two different ways, and I think either one is sufficiently correct. One is that it's the probability of getting any one trial correct when you're modeling an outcome that has more than one trial. So if you have a binary outcome, that's like one trial. If you have a zero or a one. If you have two trials, then there's two chances to get it correct, and P is the probability of getting any, either of those correct. So the trials are indistinguishable. They're just considered repeated um, attempts at something. And the model then takes the probability of getting any one trial correct, multiplies it by the number of trials, and that gets you back to your predicted mean. So if there's you know, 100 trials, and you have a P of 0.9, that means you're predicted to have 90 correct out of 100. Or you can think of it as 0.9 as proportion correct. Either way works. And so this is a picture I stole from Wikipedia, of course, as to what a binomial distribution would predict for the number of correct trials if the total number of trials were 20. So if the, the mean of the distribution were 0.1, that's the blue lines here, the mean of the distribution were 0.5, that's the red lines, and then a mean of 0.9 are the green lines. So the thing that's nice about this distribution is that it understands that you can't go above 1 and you can't go below 0. So it predicts some degree of skewness as a result of either floor effects, meaning a lot of people who don't do very well, or ceiling effects, a lot of people who do do very well. But there's not that much skewness. So if you have a variable that has more skewness sort of than predicted, it's going to have what we call over-dispersion, or basically extra variability beyond what this distribution predicts. So this distribution doesn't have a separate variance, just like Bernoulli doesn't have a separate variance. Okay, that bringing some, bring some bells coming back? So then we have other things that we can do to it 
And there's basically four categories that I want to show you. Um, there's beta that we could use instead, but that's very difficult to interpret. And more to the point, it's limited in the fact that beta does not include zeros or ones. So if you're trying to model proportion correct and you have people who got nothing right or people who got everything right, you would have to add a submodel that predicts the logit of getting a zero or another submodel that predicts the logit of getting a one in addition to the main submodel that predicts the logit corresponding to the proportion correct between zero and one. So that's kind of clunky. So then there's a compromise, the beta binomial, which essentially says that the p-parameter itself follows a beta distribution. And this can be tricky to figure out, but I think you can think of it as analogous to how the negative binomial extends the Poisson, the beta binomial extends the binomial. So there's a nested model comparison that we can do using a likelihood ratio test to see if the additional beta component the scale factor that multiplies the variance is useful to the model. And beyond binomial and beta binomial, there's also zero inflated versions of both. So then you would pick up in those cases an extra submodel that predicts the logit of being an extra zero. So let me go back to the picture here. So for instance, in this blue distribution here on the left, the distribution because the mean is so low, does predict that some people are going to get exactly no trials correct, right? There is a predicted zero. But the question is, are there more zeros than what would be predicted by the binomial or the beta binomial? If so, then a zero inflation model allows those extra zeros to exist at a minimum, but then you can also predict why they're there. But we have the same sort of interpretational ambiguity because some people in the model are actual zeros that should be there according to a binomial distribution, whereas others are considered extra zeros that are part of the inflation factor. And that kind of makes my head hurt, but it's the version that's much more readily available, the zero inflated versions. Otherwise, if you wanted to do a hurdle version, that is possible. Do you remember what hurdle is? That phrase? as an analog to uh, zero inflated? What's a hurdle? It is, uh, we can use two submodels. The first one is to pre predict the zeros and not zeros, and the other one is for the rest of the count. Yep, exactly. We take the outcome and we split it. So we predict the logit of having a zero or not zero in one model. So all the zeros go into that submodel. And then among the people who are not zero, we can predict the amount. So in this case, it would be uh, the proportion above zero. And for a count variable, it would be the number of counts. And so that falls under a general category of model. I think I have slides on this. I feel like I, I, feel like I did. If and how much. <laughs> That's what I call them. So the, the logic of a hurdle model, uh, you're predicting if you have a score basically above zero, and then how much if so. And in continuous distributions, such as if you have log normal or gamma, which we haven't talked about yet, they're called two-part models, by the way. So that's still coming yet. All right, I think that was, that was the end of, of that. Does that help bring us back to the idea here? So big picture, we're still in the world of generalized models for proportion correct because we have to worry about predicted proportions that go outside the bounds. But just throwing a logit link on it isn't going to be good enough. We need to make sure that we have variance that is allowed to change with the mean because of the boundaries, as well as the potential for extra variance and or extra variance or zero inflation. Okay, any questions before we jump back into the example? Am I talking too fast today? Like proprioceptively, I feel like I'm like really amped. It may have something to do with the three cups of coffee I had this morning, which is a little more than my standard, but you got to do what you got to do. Maybe if we could get to actual spring weather, we wouldn't need so much coffee. Like seriously, it's almost April. Why do I still have a winter coat on? This is demoralizing. 
but we shall get there eventually. All right, so this is where we were playing around with some practice data uh, last time, example 4a. So these data are not available in your download packet because they're real data from one of my first publications. Uh, the background of the story is that we are predicting proportion correct on a, a measure of grammatical understanding in 97 fourth grade children. The children either have a condition known as specific language impairment, which means that they have no other documented disabilities, but for whatever reason, grammar is just really hard for them, versus children who have non-specific language impairment in which they have disability that is uh, spread more broadly across their various skill sets. And we're also controlling for mother's education because everyone says you have to in this field. So here's what the original variable looks like. Based on the fact that it's a proportion correct, that points me towards a family of models that would be, make use of the binomial. Uh, the fact that I have so much skewness here, the question would be, can the predictors account for it? Or do I need some kind of extra variability that is a function of the mean? So not constant extra variability necessarily, but multiplicative in the same way that for the negative binomial, it's a multiplicative factor that multi it literally multiplies the mean squared to give us a predicted variance that grows as the mean grows. So in this case, it would need to grow as we move off of the boundaries. So the setup for the model, um, the variable that I had to work with in the data set was directly proportion correct. So I had to reverse engineer number correct out of it. So I did that by computing the number of trials arbitrarily as 100, since it's already in a proportion, and then multiplying the proportion correct times the number of trials to get to incorrect. And yes, I know a word that it's misspelled. That's OK. Here, watch this. Add to dictionary. Got it. Add to dictionary. Add to dictionary. Then I'm going to make all the lines go away. There. Ta-da. That looks much better. So I also needed to compute proportion incorrect in order to fit models for one inflation as zero inflation. So we'll get to those today. So it turns out that in the syntax, I'm going to be using n trials and n correct in both stata and SAS, but R takes n correct and n incorrect, just for fun. Okay. And I'm using two packages in Stata that were user developed, meaning they're not part of standard Stata. So to do, to be able to use those, you can uncomment these two lines and then just run this command search and a separate window is going to pop up and you can pick the package to download and it will download and install it. So Stata has these packages, just like R does, that are written by regular users that you can make use of. And so these are two that I found, I think, by the authors of your textbook, if not um, some of their colleagues. And so we're going to be using those two. All right. Questions so far on the setup? Good. Cool. All right. Moving right along then. So the first model that we looked at is an empty model. Not because it is useful for predicted sake, but it's useful for making sure you know what the model is doing. <laughs> so I cannot stress that enough. When you're, in the, when you're in the wild, right, when you have a data set and you have a, a data analysis task to do and you're not sure what you're doing and you're not sure what the software is doing, the empty model is your friend. Because the mean that you get back will tell, will tell you how the model is operating, what it is trying to predict. So that's what we're doing first here, is just an empty model. So in SAS, Glimix is where I'm, I'm using here, it is, the DV itself is this ratio. So it needs to know, in order to fit a binomial distribution, the number of correct trials over the number of trials. So because this is an educational context where the answers are correct or incorrect, I'm saying it's number correct but it could be anything like number of items endorsed, for instance, or number of symptoms on a checklist. Number of events is the language that is commonly used that's a little more agnostic than correct, but correct is what the context is right here. So that's the main difference in terms of what the model setup looks like. 
Uh, we're in link equals logit and dist equals binomial. And I'm using an estimate statement to get me the predicted probability that goes with my intercept. That's the number that will match the mean of the observed variable. In Stata, I'm using GLM, which is their sort of generic general linear models packet, package, I should say. Link equals logit, and then family equals binomial with n trials second inside the parentheses. And so that is how you tell it how many total trials there are. And it's advantageous that it allows you to do this because then you can have people in the same analysis with a different possible number of trials. So you can account for unbalanced data within the model directly, which is usually why people compute proportions in the first place, is to adjust for different totals possible. And let's see, Stata's margins works a little bit differently. Rather than giving the probability back, it tries to recompute the mean given the number of trials. So the mean of this variable, for instance, is 0.92. That's the mean percent correct. Once you convert it into number of events over number total, it's 92 out of 100. So in Stata's output, for instance, the margins gives you a 92 as the predicted outcome. So it's the actual number of predicted correct trials as opposed to a proportion. But obviously, if you move the decimal over two places, it works out to be the same thing. Okay. And let's see where the R could go. We did R? Yep, haven't done R yet. Here we are. Ha, ah, that was a joke. Here we are. See? I may be boring as shit, but I'm funny. Here we are. So I'm back in VGLM, for better or worse, and I have use, I'm using their binomial FF function. Inside that is logit link, and I'm using C bind and the two variables here to make myself the same idea of a Y variable as a ratio, except that this ratio is number correct and number incorrect instead of number total. It also allows you, with this option right here, to feed in separate columns for all the possible numbers of trials in a multivariate setup. But this seems like it would be easier. And of course, it doesn't give you all the, the model fit statistics that you want, so I'm asking for those as usual. And it still doesn't give you the Pearson chi-square over degrees of freedom index of conditional fit, so I'm making those in both versions as well. So that statistic is problematic. It's 21, meaning that we have like 21 times as much variance as the model thinks we should. Part of the reason for that, though, is because it's an empty model with no predictors. So we'll see how much that improves after adding predictors. And let's see, in Stata, here's the same number with a slightly different uh, denominator instead. And in R, we get pretty much the same results. Here is the predicted probability, and here are the Pearson chi-square residual uh, degrees of freedom fit statistics. Okay, so then we added a couple predictors. The aforementioned grouping variable of NLI versus SLI, so the reference group are children who have non-specific language impairment, whose mothers graduated high school. So all the thing, only thing that changes is the addition of those two fixed slopes to the model. I am asking for a, an, a chi-square test, a walled test of the two together. So basically, do I have a significant prediction? The analog to the f-test for an r-square in a regression framework. And I'm able to do that in test, in stata as well. And let's see. Oh, yes, E form, getting myself some odds ratios out of Stata for whatever reason. Um, SAS, no, it does, in this model it does. Sorry, I forgot where I'm at. So you can get odds ratios out of SAS directly. And I think I may have done that in R, but I can't remember now. This is what happens when I, like, I make the handout two weeks in advance. By the time I actually talk about it, I can't remember what's in it because now my mind's in the one that I'm making for this week. So forgive my memory lapses, but at least it's all written down. Okay, uh, yeah, new predictors there. Everything else is pretty much the same. I'm using GLHT to do my multivariate wald test uh, per usual here. So the misfit of the conditional model is 
better, but still nowhere good enough. I will point out a couple of things about the solution. So the fixed intercept, so the expected proportion correct for a child with non-specific language impairment whose mother graduated high school is 0.956. So talk about boundaries, right? Without this type of uh, link function on the model, certainly the predicted proportion correct is going to go out of bounds. So in this context, it does definitely seem to matter. And according to this model, both of our predictors are significant. So children who have specific language impairment look like they're doing a little bit, a little bit worse. And children whose mothers have more education are doing a little bit better. And just as a review, what metric is this solution in right here? What do these numbers mean? Logit. These are logits. So that's why it looks sort of strange. So minus 1.22 is the difference in logits, where the logit is trying to predict the probability that any one trial is correct, multiplied by the number of trials possible. So then here's the odds ratios that go with this. Um, so here, one of our few, few examples of a negative slope translating into an odds ratio that is between 0 and 1. This is the reason I don't like odds ratios, because I can't tell which of these is a bigger effect. It looks like this one should be much bigger, but it's hard to tell in this metric. So I'm not a fan, but the rest of the world uses them, so I want you to have them. And then we would say, yes, the model is wildly significant, but there's still no such thing as a true R-square for these sorts of outcomes, at least. Um, not one that's readily agreed upon because there's no separately estimated residual variance by which to judge how much we've explained. In the Stata output, everything is pretty much the same. It's trying to help you. I like that it does this, by the way. Like, what have you estimated? Binomial. What does that mean again? Oh, that means the variance is the mean times 1 minus the mean divided by the number of trials. And the link function is the log of the mean over that. So it works out that it's the same, same idea as what we did for binary data. And Stata, of course, puts the constant last, much to my chagrin. At least it's consistent. And we get pretty much the same results out of R at BGLM, although they're off by like just this much, just a tiny bit this time. And uh, as I mentioned last week, you will not have a homework on this unit. Your next homework is going to be on counts. And it's not ready yet, which is good, right? Because that means you have nothing to do for this class right now other than reading. The next thing you'll have to do is going to be a formative assessment. So I will get that ready probably later today or early tomorrow. So here's my minus 2 log likelihood. Here's the fit statistics. Not good enough. So before I would go and write up this model, I definitely want to try to do something about the fit being so terrible. So let's see if we can get better fit. So I'm going to try a combination of several different options for adding something to try to make it fit better. So everything that I'm about to show you, this model is nested within as the simpler case. So we're keeping the linear predictor the same, the same two predictors go in and have fixed slopes. But then the question is, what else is needed so that we can get to a better conditional distribution fit? So first option is something that I'm familiar with in the context of longitudinal data. So when I tried to build an example with the same data set measured over time, kindergarten through fourth grade, I figured out that there weren't that many options for binomial distributions that also have random effects. But this is one of them. So this actually makes use of random effects, and I think this is where we were end, ended up with last time, just starting to talk about this. I am adding a variance component to the model, a source of variability, and it is not a function of the mean. So it's just an extra variance. And the notation that I'm using is consistent with how I normally indicate random intercepts with a u, and zero for the, uh, the fact that it's an intercept as opposed to some kind of slope, and an i because each person gets their own. So conceptually, this u is used to represent the idea that what we're adding to the model is an extra source of variability, where each person gets their own deviation from the mean, and the variability 
is across those deviations. So it's between person variability and the outcome. Its purpose here is essentially to become like an E, just like a regular residual. So it's allowing extra variability as a way of dealing with overdispersion. And this strategy is known more commonly as an observation level random effect. You will see it by those search terms. So if you're looking in the Google, those would be the words to ask it about. So in Glimix, which is a package that we can use for any kind of fixed or random effects models, I have added these two lines right here. The random line indicates what random effects I want to add to the model, what sources of variability. The word random, by the way, means everybody gets their own. So it's like, what does each person get their own of? Well, for now, just an intercept. And it wants to know by what variable each person gets their own. So you need to give it the person level ID variable right there. And then this code test thing does a likelihood ratio test against a model without it, which is the one that we just estimated, to see if this helps the fit. So we're testing whether it fits significantly better after adding this one new parameter, which is this random intercept soak up the extra variance thing. Okay, questions on that so far? See, I'm switching the water now. I'm going to take it down a notch. Got to pace my stomach. Yes, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, can I, I ask, ask a general, general, general question, question about, about software? software? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so if, if R and SAS differ in their results, results which, which one, how do you know which one to go with? Oh, goodness. See, see that is a, that's like a three-beer question right there. Like that, that's like a whole discussion. I think it depends on who you ask. Personally, I trust SAS and I trust Stata and I trust any package that has professional programmers whose job it is to make sure things are right and numerically stable. And I don't mind paying for that privilege. Um, the problem with R is the same reason people love R. It's free and anyone can write a package. So if you get different results in R, my intuition is to be suspicious relative to the other packages, um, which is another good reason why when you're getting into models that are this complicated, it's good to know how to do things in several packages so that you can look for converging results. Um, just as an example, when I was writing my textbook, um, I have a longitudinal analysis textbook. By the time I got to three level models and models with crossed random effects, I started to get differences across packages. So SPSS, for instance, did absolutely fine with the crossed random effects models, but it crapped out on half of the three level models and wouldn't estimate. Stata crapped out on the crossed random effects models, but the three level models were fine. And one of my tasks, I think probably starting this summer, is to start to add R code to the book's website so that I have it in those packages as well. But to answer your question for now, my inclination is to be suspicious of R. Um, it doesn't no, no. help that there's 8 million packages that all claim to do the same thing. <laughs> and then, no, yeah, and so, and then someone would pipe up, well, but, but it's open source. You can see exactly what it does. And to somebody like me, who is not great at estimation and who is not great at programming, the fact that I can see it does not help me because I don't know enough to evaluate it. And that's why I depend on people who know more than I do with respect to estimation, numerical stability, and those sorts of issues. So, I, I, have, I have opinions on this topic, but what I understand from your students' perspective is that the world has moved into R. And as much as I don't like it, and I may not trust it, I think that I would be doing a bad job if I didn't help prepare you for the world as it is. So we're using R, but I also want you to, if you can, to pick up these other packages so that you've got options. Fair? Fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't know you opened a can of worms, did you, Farhan? Uh, next question. Yeah, sorry, but in the gradient method, Laplace, what is that? Oh, thank you. Um, this is a method of estimation. So... <laughs> 
Yeah, so this is one of the things that you'll learn about in the Bayesian psychometric course, is when you have models that have some kind of non-normal residual distribution and random effects, then there is not a, there's no way to figure out what all the model parameters would be without integrating over the distribution of the random effect. It's the exact same problem that you have in estimating IRT models or any kind of latent variable models. And there are various ways to do this. The one that I am using, I think, is the only one that SAS will let work with this particular combination. Laplace is a type of full information, marginal maximum likelihood that is equivalent to using only one quadrature point. And that sentence is the end of my knowledge on that topic. That's what I know. Um, I can give you uh, suggestions for books to read about this, and I suspect the Agresti book has some text on this about estimation, but it is a more complex version of estimation because it's a more complex model with respect to the variability side. And that is one of the primary reasons why Bayesian analysis is used in the context of psychometrics as well as multi-level mixed effects models more generally is sometimes maximum likelihood just craps out. Like it can't handle the amount of random effects because every random effect that you add adds a dimension to be integrated over. And so any method that relies on quadrature or basically trying out different values across all the possibilities is going to be slow, inefficient, and potentially break. So maximum likelihood is a way to get answers if maximum likelihood is not a plausible, if it's not going to work for your particular problem. But that could be a whole nother class. And in fact, it is being offered this fall on Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay. Yay for questions. Keep them coming. I feel like I'm on a quiz show. What's next? I got my hand over the buzzer. I'm ready. What does it mean to say that the residual distribution is non-normal? Ah, uh, general linear models that we started with, the residuals are supposed to be normal. Another way of saying that is that the conditional distribution, meaning after the fixed effects have their say, and in this context, after the random effects have their say as well, what's left follows a normal distribution. Anytime that what's left doesn't follow a normal distribution. So like this right here, what's left is binomial. So if you have a binomial distribution on sort of the, the lowest level and then you're adding random effects to it, that combination does not have a form that is um, recognizable that you can operate on. In contrast, if I had, say, a general linear model with a normal conditional distribution, so the E's are supposed to be normal, and I have a random intercept that it has a normal distribution also, I can put those together and the multivariate normal distribution still works. So that has an easy form. It's fast to estimate. People know what to do with it. So whenever you're sort of mixing and matching, like you have a normal distribution for this variable, but you have a binomial for that one, then you can, there's, the easiness of estimation goes away because there's not a common um, way to catch both. And so what happens is that you have to figure out what the parameters are by trying on a possible value for the random intercept for each person. And that trying on process is accomplished via quadrature, which is like if you say you have 15 quadrature points, like picture like a, a distribution, and it's like you're rectangling the distribution and you try on, what would, what would the likelihood be if my U was this? What would the likelihood be if my U was that? What would it be if it was that? And you do that 15 times. Then you weight that by how likely each of those potential values are and sum it across, and then you've integrated across that distribution. So that's necessary, again, backing up to the question, that is necessary anytime you step out of normal distribution for the residuals. You're welcome. What else? Go for it. Oh, what does the zero mean? You wouldn't know, and it's trying to correct my grammar. You know, it would be better to not have space after this punctuation. Thank you, Word. That's, that's very sweet. That Stata runs on punctuation, and so does SAS, or SAS does, I should say. The zero is, so what, it, what is being list, listed there in that type of statement more generally 
is all of the model for the variance parameters. So if you had multiple random effects, you'd have multiple values there. And zero means, can you tell me what the log likelihood would be if this one wasn't there? So you can tell it to shut off some of them and re-estimate the model, essentially, without having to re-estimate the model. Only With the random part, exactly. So this is a very long explanation of saying what this is going to do is give me a likelihood ratio test against a version of the model where this random intercept variance is not there, so that I don't have to do it myself manually in this one context. So it's like a nested model comparison using likelihoods. Okay, what else? All right, then in Stata, I am switching to MEGLM. Any guesses, Stata folks, as to what the ME stands for? Let's see, Kendall, Sam, who else is a Stata user here? I'm putting you on the spotlight. Nikki, that's right. Any guesses? What's ME stand for? The answer is mixed effects. And why I'm making a point of this, Stata users, is that there are a whole bunch of Stata routines that start with ME for the mixed effects version. So like there's ME logit and ME probit and ME this and ME that. So this is sort of the generic analog to Glimix. Glimix is generalized linear mixed models. Up to this point, we haven't had any mixed effects in it. I think this is the first time we have. And MEGLM is the analog. So it has a bunch of different link functions and distributions available in it, but it also allows you to add random effects, which is why we're using it in this case. So in Stata, but you know how SAS, everything is about the semicolons? In Stata, everything is about the commas. And this drove me nuts when I was first learning Stata because I couldn't get the logic of when commas would show up. And eventually, I think I have it now. So this is the DV. These are the predictors. Then a comma. Then we have this section, which is terminated by a comma. And this is where you tell it what kind of random effects you want. So the bar bar thing here denotes the random part of the model. And ID serves the same purpose, random over what sampling dimension. So subject equals ID here corresponds to this ID here in a colon. And then this blank space before the comma means intercept. Because in Stata, anytime you estimate a mixed effects model, random intercept variances show up by default. You don't have to ask for them, whereas you actually have to write the word intercept in SAS. So just referencing this much is going to give you a random intercept variance across subjects. Then, because I'm not done yet, then come what I would think of as the usual Stata option structure. So Stata is like, do something, comma, options about the thing in the same way that SAS uses slash for options about the thing. So then all of this are options about the thing. So link function, which family, and then integration method, which is Laplace here. And I think there's other choices as well. But I'm using it to stay consistent across programs with respect to the output as much as I can. Otherwise, this is all the same. Here's the Chidi code to get the minus 2 log likelihood out of the stored results. And then here's the test for the multivariate wall test. And then I'm doing the same thing, again, adding e-form to get odds ratios. And I have odds ratios out of SAS, it looks like, too. Okay. Then our users. I am switching to Glimmer. <laughs> I think that's how you would say that. Or G. Elmer, I think, is probably how they intended it. So Elmer is a routine that fits linear mixed effects, random maybe, regressions? I'm not sure what R stands for, but ME is in there again. And so this is inside the LME package, I believe, if I remember correctly. 
and it has a similar structure with respect to the DV and the family, but then we have this thing on the end here, that's your random intercept. So the number one corresponds to intercept. I believe that is a default, but I've gotten used to writing the ones in there so that I can keep track of what's all in my model. And then ID is the person level ID, ID variable and the bar then is for that. So this is the first time I've used Glimmer. I'm used, I've used Elmer instead in my other classes. Okay. And then getting the rest of the output that is not given by default, the multivariate wall test. And then I'm doing my own likelihood ratio test. So I know there's a million routines in R to do likelihood ratio tests, and rather than try to figure out which one works with this particular permutation, I just did it myself. So I have deviance test A, because I have like four of these in this handout, so I had to start labeling them, is minus two times the log likelihood for the, the binary or binomial model, minus the log likelihood for the binomial model with additive over dispersion that we're talking about right here. And so then I get the, the chi-square uh, p-value that goes with this, cut it in half to create the mixture version, and then ask for them to be printed. And in Stata, I forgot to mention this, the likelihood ratio test for whether or not you need the random intercept variance is done for you automatically in any of the ME packages. They all do that, which is a nice feature. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Yes. In R? In R, yes. So the ref p-value, no, the def test A and mix p-value A mm -hmm. are the result that we have we have to compare with the 3.84 and the 2.72. Uh, you don't have to do the comparison. This function right here gives ah, you the exact okay. uh, p-value that goes with the chi-square distribution. Right. And so then all I have to do is within the function is tell it what the test statistic is, which is this dev, dev test, how many degrees of freedom, and then whether I want it to be, w which way basically to go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so then I just cut it in half to make the mixture version, which works in this case. Not always, but in this case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So survey says, the output looks a little bit different once you add stuff in. Um, it also gives you the fit of the conditional distribution directly. So this is like after the random intercept has had its say. So in these sorts of models, fixed and random effects are all both considered part of the linear predictor. So the conditional distribution fit then is about what's left over. And in this case, now it's a really small number. Now what, from what I've read about this, if this were in a regular situation in which we didn't have a random intercept, that would indicate under dispersion, meaning that we have less variance than what the model says. But because we deliberately saturated the extra variance, I think it's okay. Then we have one new table of output that shows up here. Covariance parameter estimates. It's a bad name because what they really mean are variance parameter estimates. But because some of these are covariances too in certain models, they labeled it sort of generally. So like you can have a covariance matrix that has variances on the diagonal and covariances on the off-diagonal. They're borrowing that sort of terminology. So then the intercept, what that number is, this is the variability across people in the per-subject random intercepts. It's in logits. And so this is the thing that we want to test basically whether it's greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, then this improves the model relative to the standard binomial. And one thing I want to note are these gradients right here. So this is an extra piece of output that I have not seen in any of the other packages. Gradients are uh, first derivatives of that parameter with respect to the likelihood function. And if the parameter is being estimated well, then the first derivative, which is its slope as you get to the top of where the maximum likelihood estimate is, should be completely flat. And you'll note that these numbers are coming off zero. Normally you see these as like scientific notation. Like, let me back up. Yeah, so like this is what it looked like before. Like e to the negative six, e to the negative nine, 
like they're tiny, tiny numbers, they're heading off of that here. So that's an indication that these sorts of models are harder to estimate. And so this column I use as sort of a troubleshooting if it breaks, like what, which parameter is responsible for it blowing up. But now, if we look at the results, big difference. So mother's education was significant at P less than 0 0.001 before. Now it has a p-value of 0.8. Huge difference. The other predictor is still significant, and it's still a negative effect. And is this model better after adding this random intercept variance? This is the result of the COBE test option. The chi-square value right here, 981, that is the difference in minus 2 log likelihood between this model and the model that did not have a random intercept variance, the binomial only. And MI down here is SAS's way of saying, yeah, I used a mixture chi-square for this, meaning I cut your p-value in half and it's even smaller. So it looks like this helped, but this may not be the best solution. In Stata, we get this box right here. That's your random intercept variance. And LR test versus logistic model chi bar 201. <laughs> that is Stata 4. Here's your likelihood ratio test. And the same test statistic of 981 is the difference in minus 2 log likelihood relative to the straight up binomial model. The fact that it's chi bar 01 is its way of saying that it used a mixture chi square distribution. So it's a mixture of degrees of freedom 0 and degrees of freedom 1. Degrees of freedom zero cannot happen, and so that's why you can get a mixture p-value in this context by just taking your p-value and cutting it in half. And in R, we get similar uh, story here. So the, the uh, z-value is also pointing to the same non-significant, slightly different result, but Pretty, pretty close. Not, not matching exactly, but close enough. Same conclusion for sure. And yeah, the p-value is 0 to 215 decimal places. So yeah, i definitely say that that's a, an improvement. So in the context of mixed effects models where you have a binomial outcome, this is sort of the strategy that you're stuck with, is adding in this extra random intercept. Other options are available to you if you are not in the context of needing mixed effects for other things. So this is multiplicative over dispersion via beta binomial. So the previous model had additive over dispersion, meaning let's just like stick a random intercept in for each person. That's going to soak up the unexplained variance. This is a different strategy. So this is the one beta binomial is analogous to negative binomial in that it takes binomial and it estimates a scale factor that stretches out the variance. And it's a multiplicative scale factor. The conditional variance then, I think, is given by this formula right here. So it is being multiplied by the thing that the scale factor is in. So the variance stretches as the mean changes. And I'm set, I have a note here that I tried to make, get the math to work out. It's very close, but not exact. But that's the general gist of it. So to do this model, I had to do some hunting to figure out where I could find it. And I had to get into something I had never used before in SAS, which is PROC FMM, finite mixture model. I didn't know that SAS did mixture models until this, but that was the only place that I could find a built-in function for beta binomial as a distribution. Uh, PROC finite mixture model, though, does not have a lot of the other uh, bells and whistles in SAS that I like to use, like estimate statements or contrast statements or that kind of stuff, so we're going to be doing fewer things. Um, I did compute predicted outcomes from the model, so the model is going to give us predicted proportion corrects that we can correlate with the actual one to get a sense of our level of prediction. And I was not able to get it to do a likelihood ratio test against the straight binomial model, so I had to do it myself. So in SAS, all computations have to happen within, inside a database. So 
So I'm opening up a database, typing numbers into it, and then creating the likelihood ratio test as new variables. So data work.lrtb is the name of the data set. I'm making two new variables by pasting in the minus two log likelihoods for my comparison models. So the deviance for the, bi the binomial model is 1531. The deviance minus two log likelihood for the beta binomial is 531. So I don't really need to do the rest of this because these, dif these models differ by like a thousand. You remember what the cutoff is? What is a significant likelihood ratio test chi-square value of what at alpha equals 0.05? What's critical chi-square for that? Anyone? See, I know this. I'm earning my boring. Two point something? Uh, 2.71 for a mixture chi-square with one degree of freedom. And regular flavor chi-square is 3.84. So my models differ by like a thousand. A thousand decidedly more than three. But I'm going to figure out the exact p-value because I want you to know how to do this. So I computed my test statistic as a new variable, told it the degrees of freedom, and then computed a p-value using the prob chi function. And this one is a cumulative, so it's 1 minus that. And then cut it in half to make another variable and then asked for it to be printed. The other thing that I'm doing here is asking for the correlation of the predicted proportion correct from this model versus the actual one, so that I can get a sense of an R-square, or an analog to an R-square. So a few extra pieces of output to see how useful the model is in a predictive sense. So I know that's a lot of code there that is relatively new, but the same concepts that we've seen a few times. Any questions on that so far? All right. And then two predictor beta binomial with multiplicative over dispersion in Stata. This is the custom routine beta bin that I found to do this. Beta bin looks a lot like the, reg the rest of Stata. It wants to know your link function and the number of trials total. It does not provide conditional fit though, unfortunately. The other thing that I realized after looking at the output is that it gives a scale factor as a reciprocal. So I'm asking it to display it in the same metric as SAS so that we can see that they match. And then I'm doing my own likelihood ratio test with a series of display commands here. So Stata works like a calculator if you ask it to. So display just means print the result as opposed to store it somewhere. So I am creating my test statistic, then getting my p-value using this chi2 function that I found, and then cutting it in half to get the mixture version then asking it to predict the model version of proportion correct, correlate it with the real one, and then square that correlation. So the same steps in Stata as in SAS thus far. And then they also have an E form if you'd like to get odds ratios out of that. So just like the rest of Stata works that way. And R folks, I am still in VGLM and I found beta binomial. And I'm keeping logitlink, but I had to change what the arguments were for it. So I have L mu, which I believe is the linear predictor, because that would make sense given the notation, and L rho, which I have no idea what the hell that is. But what I do know is that I did not get the right numbers when I left it out. <laughs> so L rho for the win. The rest of it looks the same. And once again, doing a likelihood ratio test myself. And then using the predict function to generate predicted proportion correct. Core test to get the correlation with actual percent correct. And then squaring the result to get me an R square. All right. So survey says, just for fun, Proc mixture model does not give the same output as Glimix. It gives me the Pearson statistic, which is the sum of the Pearson residuals. So I had to divide it by 97 myself, which worked out to be 0.74. So a little bit of under dispersion maybe, but not bad. It provides me with this thing right here, in which I think 
If it simplifies to one, we're back at the binomial distribution, but I'm not 100% certain on that. But what I am 100% certain on is that I can do a likelihood ratio test to see whether this extra thing adds anything. And this is the test statistic of like 1,000. The last piece of this is trying to generate an R square. So this correlation result right here, 0 0.39662 is the correlation between the proportion correct predicted by the model and the actual one. So this is my way of getting something resembling an R-square, which works out to be about 15% of the variance. Anytime that you're going to do something like this, by the way, this goes in your results section. So when there's a non-standard way of trying to figure out which model is best, like using a likelihood ratio test, or trying to figure out an effect size, describe exactly what you did, because there's not necessarily one way to do this. I think this is a reasonable way, so that's what I chose to do, but people can disagree with me. So then I get these two things that indicate the beta part of the beta binomial. Uh, one over five, this is the one that is given by SAS, it's one over that, and then this is the log of that. So then I took this number and printed the reciprocal down here so that you could get to the same scale factor as given by SAS. So I'm not 100% certain how it's being parameterized differently given these different numbers, but it's the same concept. It's like stretchy binomial, and it definitely fits better. And R gave it to me this way. It called it an intercept. It is decidedly not an intercept. You could label it as a scale factor or a stretchy factor or a log scale stretchy, but an intercept is not acceptable. But that's what it is. So it's, this is the log over one over, log of one over the scale factor as given by SAS. That's what this number is. And then the likelihood ratio tests and everything match. And so all of that matches. So up to this point, it looks like I would say that the, either of the extra variance models looks promising. I have a comparison. Let me skip ahead to that for just a second here. I have a table I made at the end. This is the last page of the handout where I summarized all the different models that we started with. So regular, regular flavor binomial is the one that's the worst so far. It definitely does not fit. Here's the version that has additive over dispersion with the random intercept, much better. Here's the version that has beta binomial that we just looked at, much better. So for these three sections right here, smaller is better. So based on that, it looks like beta binomial wins relative to the random intercept version of over dispersion. But is it good enough yet? That's the question. Because in the original model, the original variable, I had a whole lot of extra ones, and I want to make sure that those are being accounted for. All right. Questions? So far. So most of the kids in this sample got 100% on this test. So what I wanted to find was one inflation, but I didn't find it. Question. Yeah, in this data, you have the proportion of something. It is that the predicted proportion in page, sorry, page 11. Page 11, let's find it. Right. Yeah. Oh. Wait. There, in the data results, you have something called proportion in the constant or intercept. Yes, that proportion point. Nine, nine, oh, this. Nine, this is our this is our output, but yes. Ah, uh, so that's the um, that's related to the intercept. That's the predicted. Yes. This is the the probability that corresponds to this logit. To the logit. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I'm making a note that it's right on the boundary at nice. this point. So this is why I'm worried about the model being able to accommodate as many cases that have a one because even a beta binomial wouldn't necessarily predict that, there, that there's such a high proportion of people that, that have one. So like if you look back at the original variable, for instance, this, like 45% of the cases have a one. 
So the question is, do, does the beta binomial model have enough of a pile over here to it? So that was the last two models that I wanted to fit. And it turns out that one inflation models are not a thing. I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't figure out a way to say, I have extra ones. I need a submodel for whether you're an extra one. So do you know what I did? I hacked it. Screw it, we're gonna predict proportion incorrect instead. Can I do that? Sure I can. How would predicting proportion incorrect change my results? Let me find a predictor model in that. If I switched it, say this is my original binomial, to predict proportion incorrect instead, how would these results change? The same. The same? Or, or the, sign. the sign. The sign. Yes, the sign. The sign. Yes. Here, let me fix it. I'm going to predict proportion incorrect instead. Watch. Problem solved. It's the properties of logits. They're symmetric about zero. So I know that if the predicted proportion correct is a logit of three, the predicted proportion incorrect corresponds to a logit of negative three. So let me fix these back again before I forget it. So I can do that. It's likelihood equivalent. It's just phrasing the model from the opposite direction of what's being predicted. All right. So then I did, since we're running out of time here, I'll spare you the, the full story. So then I tried two more. Regular flavor binomial that has zero inflation by adding, by predicting number incorrect. And I'm able to do that in SAS with proc finite mixture model by adding this thing right here, which is a zero inflation submodel that's empty. There's no predictors in it, so I'm just testing whether or not I need zero inflation. Doing a likelihood ratio test, the difference is like 500. So yes, zero inflation helps the binomial at least. In Stata, I found it with ZIB, zero inflated binomial is what that stands for. And I fed it two new pieces of information here. iLink gives me the link function for the zero inflation submodel, which I also want to be logit, and then inflate tells me what predictors to put inside the zero inflation submodel, and that's an intercept only. And in R, zibinomialafuf, <laughs> I think is how you say that, or something very close. Zibinomialafuf, it's built in. And then it gets even funnier. L prob. I think that is the linear predictor, is logit link. And then I'm going to go with lone mimpetishafur. Anyone want to try that? That's not a word. Again, I don't know what it is. I guessed it had to be the zero inflation submodel based on the context. And so I picked logit link and I was right. Oh, no, it's not. It's not, actually. No, that's the link. And then I had to do this. And I initially left these things off and I didn't get the right answer. So I went back to the manual and I found them and then I got the right answer and I have no idea what they mean. Welcome to R. <laughs> I just keep trying until I get the numbers that match. So you can check the documentation for more information about that. So then likelihood ratio test. So adding zero inflation is better relative to binomial but it's not good enough relative to where beta binomial was. The output is going to give me the logit of the probability of being an extra zero, which is 41% uh, or so. And then last but not least, beta binomial was zero inflation, which combines the two. So I've got a zero inflation model and a beta binomial distribution, and that one seemed to fit the best. But at this point, I've given up on the notation as to what kind of variance is being predicted by that. So, good times. But sadly, we'll have to pick this up next time. Not sad for me, because I'm not ready for Thursday yet, but now I am. <laughs> it actually makes me happy when things take longer than they're supposed to. All right.
Any questions before we adjourn for the day? No? Okay. Sounds good. Well, since it was garbage day this morning and we rescued our cans from being blown down the street, that means I say, see you Thursday. Let me know if you need anything. And thank you for being here. Bye, folks.